This is a short video about um, gauges again. So it'll be the last video I make about them. So I think there's two other videos about gauges where you kind of see um, just what they are and the idea of them. Also about partitions and tag partitions and about what are called, usually a gauge is denoted by the Greek letter delta. It's like a function on an interval. And so if you've got a partition, we also talked about um, delta fine partitions and how those exist. Um, whenever you've got a gauge, you can also find what's called a delta, uh, yeah, delta fine partition. So if you haven't watched those, go watch those. So the last thing I want to tell you about is maybe what are these gauges used for, for right now? We'll see them again later on when we talk about the Riemann integral. But for now, it, what's the definition of saying a function's continuous on an interval i? So remember this epsilon definition that we had. So I'll denote it by this star here so I can refer to it later. But it's trying to say for every positive epsilon and for every t in your interval, the domain of your function, um, what there should exist some positive number delta such that if x is another number in the interval, that is such that x and t are within delta of each other, um, then the outputs f of x and f of t are within epsilon of each other. So in this case, what I'm going to think about then is I know that that delta is allowed to depend on both t and on epsilon if I'm just talking about continuous. And so what we can think about then is that maybe I could think of delta as like a function. And so it's a function of t. And so for each epsilon, I get a different function of t. And so what I'm trying to uh, say, if it's a function of t, and t comes from this interval i, in that case, and delta is strictly positive, then delta is a gauge. So I can think of that delta from the definition of continuity of a function as an example of a gauge. So the value of delta depends again on both epsilon and t. And so how you might denote this to emphasize that delta is a function of t that also depends on epsilon, maybe the subscript epsilon, but then the input of the function is t. So what I could do is I could rewrite the above definition just with this kind of new notation, just to emphasize again that that delta is really a type of gauge. So again, the definition of continuity from the gauge perspective is for every positive epsilon and for every input t, uh, you can find a gauge uh, delta epsilon t, such that if x is in your interval i, the domain of your function f, that is, is such that, uh, again, the distance between t and x is less than just whatever the output of the gauge at t is, again, the point where I'm considering if f's continuous at, uh, then what should, that, what should happen? Then the output of my function at t and x, those should be within epsilon of each other. All right, so then Gauges, again, give us kind of another tool in order to maybe come up with some of the results that we've already seen before without them. So gauges can be used to prove a bunch of the following things. So continuous functions on a closed and bounded interval a, b, with brackets on the end. Um, continuous functions on such an interval are bounded. Uh, continuous functions on such an interval, they have to achieve their absolute max and their absolute minimum. So they actually have a value there. And uh, it could be, gauges can be used to prove the location of roots theorem for continuous functions. And uh, gauges can be used to show that continuous functions on, again, a closed bounded interval are, in fact, uniformly continuous. So uh, each of these results were covered in earlier videos. What I'm saying is you could give an alternative proof of each one of these by using this theory of these gauge functions. And just to try to demonstrate that, I wanted to try to do number four with you. So how do I use gauges to show that fact? So the proof of number four, let's let epsilon be bigger than zero. So what do I know? Well, I get to assume that f's continuous on a closed bounded interval a, b. And so what does that tell me then? So it's continuous at each point in that interval. So therefore, well, I'm gonna use my new, not really new, but my restated definition of continuity in terms of these gauges here. It's really the same thing, just replace delta with this kind of new function notation is all I'm trying to say to do. So I'll do that down here. So there should exist um, some number delta t that's positive such that if x is in my interval and if x minus t, if the absolute value or the distance between those two points is less than two times delta t, you'll see where this two is important uh, a little bit later on in the proof. Then the, again, difference in the outputs or how far away the outputs are from each other should be less than epsilon over two. And you'll see why I picked that epsilon over two a little bit later in the proof. And so what do I want? Okay, um, what have I got? I've got delta is a function of each t that's in my interval where my function is defined. Uh, and it's also positive, so delta is a gauge. And that's all we had to satisfy to say this function's a gauge. And so in particular, remember that we talked about for when you've got a gauge on an interval, 
you could always find what was called a delta fine partition of that interval AB. So what we'll denote it by is, again, this kind of sequence of subintervals. Remember the idea here was you take the whole interval from A to B and you chop it up into a bunch of subintervals. That's what I sub, capital I sub I is. And then within each of those, you'd pick just a particular point called the tag, called the TI. So T sub I. That's just a particular point in the subinterval I sub I. And this notation says you would have n of them. So n of these subintervals total. So I chopped the whole interval a b into these 10 sub into these n subintervals and I picked one point within each one that I'm calling a tag. So what we're going to do is we're going to let delta sub epsilon, the subscript epsilon there, just be the minimum value or the smallest value of my gauge evaluated at each tag from my delta fine partition. And so maybe I haven't also said, I didn't say what this delta fine was. Again, maybe you should go watch the video on that. But what it's trying to say is that the interval, subinterval I sub I should be within the interval centered at TI whose length is delta TI. That was a lot to say. But if you want a picture of that, go look in the previous video. And I might draw you a picture pretty soon in this proof as well. So. Let's say you had two points, x and u, that are in your interval a, b, such that uh, x and u are within this delta epsilon of each other. Remember, delta epsilon is the minimum value of my gauge delta evaluated at each of the tags. So whichever one's the smallest one. And what we're going to do is let's pick i so that I pick out the tag that's closest to x here. Uh, and so such that uh, x, is with, x and ti are within delta ti of each other. And there's my picture finally here. So let's say, I'll try to zoom in, try to look at, here's this interval from A to B. So this is the interval from A to B here. And what I try to do is I try to say, okay, imagine chopping this up into the subintervals. So this green piece here, that's what I'm calling I1. And maybe this last one here, this would be IN. And within each one of these intervals, notice that white point, T1, that's the tag that I picked. And notice uh, over here, I picked some point TN, that's the tag for that last subinterval. So now what I'm trying to say is, so what if you, in my picture here, if I was to look at um, this orangest kind of interval here, that's the interval that's centered at T1. And what I'm trying to say is that the length from here to here is delta Ti and the length from uh, here to here is delta Ti. And similarly over here, like the length from here to here is delta Tn. And then the length from uh, here to here is delta Tn. And what I'm trying to emphasize in my picture is, let's say it looked like the distance from here to here, right, delta T1 in this case, it looked like it was smaller than, say, this last one that I bothered to draw, right? This distance looks a lot bigger. So in my picture, what I'm trying to say is, ah, this guy would be my delta sub epsilon, which again, I said was the minimum of all of them. So what happens when I take two points that are within delta sub epsilon of each other? And so that's where I'm trying to say, now I've got X and U. So here's this X and here's this U. Um, these two guys are within delta epsilon of each other, right? So this first squiggle is smaller than this big squiggle. That's what I mean there. Okay, cool. So that's where we are so far. So in that case, what I claim is, or what I want to look at then is, well, and how far is U from that TI that X is close to? So in particular, right, in my picture over here too, pick I such that X minus TI is within delta TI, so that those are within delta TI of each other. In that case, my TI is T1. And so uh, what I'm trying to look at is, I picked, I'm saying I should pick this one, right? That's the one that's closest to that particular X. So like you probably pick the tag that is in the subinterval that contains your point X, if that makes any sense. Maybe rewind that. Okay. So what I want to look at though is, well, how far away is U from TI? Can I describe that? So in my picture, how far away is U from T1? What we'll do is, well, I know how U plays with X and I know how TI plays with X, or in my picture, T1 plays with X. So what I'll do is the old trick, I'll add zero in a sneaky way and subtract X inside, use the triangle inequality to split that up. And I'll think about my hypothesis here. So I got to assume that X and U are within delta epsilon of each other. So that is where this comes from. Maybe I could use my highlighter. So I got to assume this, so this becomes less than delta epsilon. But then uh, what else do I know? Well, I also assume that X and TI are within delta TI of each other. Therefore, this is less than this. 
or less than or equal to. Anyway, I get the full less than though because these are strictly less than each other. There's a lot of highlighting going on. Uh, and so in that case though, what else do I know? Well, I know that delta epsilon is certainly smaller than whatever delta ti is, right? Delta epsilon is the smallest of all of them. So therefore this is less than two times whatever that ti is, delta ti is. So again, this is definitely smaller than that. So it's definitely, this sum is smaller than two times the bigger one. That's all I'm trying to say. And that's important because you can see that I'm about to do something with continuity. If you remember in the beginning, I was being kind of sneaky up here about how I stated the fact that F's continuous. This is where that's gonna come in handy. And so what do I wanna look at then? Okay, so for any X in my interval that are within the special delta sub epsilon of each other, um, I wanna conclude that F of X minus F of U, I really want that to be less than epsilon. If I can get that, I win the game. And so let's try and do it then. So again, I want to know about the difference between f of x and f of u. I know how each of these should play with f of ti. So what I'll do is add and subtract f of ti in the middle. I'll split that up with the triangle inequality. And let's think about what can I say about each of these pieces. So f of x minus f of ti, that comes from, both of these things come from, again, continuity. Because uh, in that case, like, f of ti minus f of u, I know that that should be less than epsilon over two because I know that u minus ti is less than two times uh, delta ti. Remember that was my hypothesis about, hypothesis about continuity. And uh, similarly for, for that first one as well, that was just the one that jumped out at me. And then the last thing, so I finally get that these two things are within, each of these individually are less than epsilon over two, therefore when you add that together, when I add these, I just get epsilon. So at the end of the day, I get that the difference in the outputs is uh, less than epsilon. So that proves, again, that uh, this function is uniformly continuous on that interval.